I want to move on a little bit um, because I think that we've pretty comprehensively talked about teenagers and, and kids and how they can benefit from vocal coaching, and they can. But I want to move on now to adults and how some vocal coaching, if not a lot of vocal coaching, can help them to advance in their careers, can help them to perhaps make friends in later years, can perhaps sort of improve their connectedness or improve their confidence. This may or may not be singing, but what I'm thinking as somebody who's interested in self-development is can vocal coaching help you with your interview skills can vocal coaching help you with your authority and we have touched on this a little bit with margaret thatcher and also elizabeth holmes who you Ooh, are now yes Yes, yes, there's an example and a half. Now, just to recap, because we talked about this during a live stream, which unfortunately didn't work out that well, um, because my microphone wasn't selected properly. But hi, Margaret Thatcher, in essence, she didn't think she sounded authoritative enough with her high pitched voice. So she lowered her voice, she trained her larynx way down and spoke like this. And we were, were talking about how, you know, she did that in order to be perceived in a certain way. Some people have criticized her for trying to sound masculine by lowering her voice. And, and that's a whole other debate. But the thing is she knew what idea of herself she wanted to project and she trained her voice in a certain way in order to achieve that what my approach would more be for people not to make their voice something different than it is but to learn to use their own voice their own natural voice in the best way possible to the best effect possible and if you learn to do that for example if i add a twang to my voice can you hear how my voice is louder can you imagine how useful that would be if i was giving a powerpoint presentation and no one had given me a microphone and I'm in a carpeted room with a hundred people in it. That is a practical skill. Also, you know, if you're doing job interviews, learning to slow down and learning to break up sentences so that the real gist of what you're saying comes across, learning to use pauses, which we don't when we're Northern Irish because we tend to speak hell for leather just like this and we don't really actually even breathe anywhere. I mean, this is something you and I are working on is improving the consonants in the voice and a lot of people don't realize that if you have soft consonants, firstly, people won't be able to understand what you're saying. Yeah. And secondly, it gives off the impression that you are not confident or that you are not assertive enough mm -hmm. if you are not putting enough pressure on the consonants, basically. Yeah. Yes, so this is something that can help both genders. I'm both actually, men. I'm gonna do a little visual description a little exercise here for people watching this. So I'm going to write a sentence where I only put in the vowels. Now, can anybody out there read that sentence? Now, I'm going to do the same sentence with the consonants. So here's the same sentence with the consonants. You can tell what that sentence is, can't you? So that is just a visual demonstration of how consonants work. And actually when people listen to a song and they go, I can never make out the lyrics to that song. It's normally because there's either a consonant missing somewhere or it's been too soft or it's been modified, like a T has been turned into a D and then people get just completely confused. They don't know what's going on. The actual sound is carried on the vowels. Um, that's why actually Italian is the language of opera because in Italian you have these beautiful words like, um, Amore, amore, which has got a lot of vowel sound in it, whereas we would say love, love, very yeah. continental, because English is a Germanic language, it's a guttural language, so Italian and the language of opera, French, the second language of opera, because again, it sound carries on the vowel, but actually learning to work your consonants, if people quite often don't understand you, that could be what's yeah, wrong, or if, when you get nervous, you trip over consonant sounds. I want to talk a little bit about accents, because mm -hmm. accents are great, and accents, I think there are a lot of beautiful accents out there, yeah. and there's nothing wrong in and of itself in having an accent, but there are some accents that are lazy with their consonants. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking sort of uh, South of Ireland, you know, Tipperary or whatever, you know, and you have no idea what they're saying because they're not putting enough emphasis on the consonants. This in a professional environment can be quite bad because if people can't understand you, it's not about how smart you are, it's about how smart people think you are. And if people can't understand you, you could be saying the smartest thing in the world and you could be contributing yeah. in a very insightful and smart way. Yeah. But if you are not 
emphasizing your consonants well enough. Yeah. There's consonants. The other thing about accents, like I was once in the back of a taxi. I lived in Wiltshire in England and I'd been home to Northern Ireland for Christmas and I went back in January to England and the taxi driver, he picked me up from the train station and said, oh, I had a Southern Irish person in the car last week, much nicer accent than yours. His was nice and lilting, which yours is very harsh. And my response to this was no tip for you, mate, because our accent is a big part of, you know, like where you come from, the, the person you are. And I just thought that's rude. But on the the other hand a couple of people said to me when I lived in England that they couldn't understand me because of the speed that I spoke at and actually you have to take that on board I mean if you live somewhere and the people around you can't understand you that's a decided problem and I had to make a concerted effort to slow down which at first was very difficult and it was funny because like when other Northern Irish people came out to visit me it was like oh now I can speak really fast again <laughs> they're used to that but you know people genuinely on a couple of occasions like, one day this girl said to me I I can't understand a word that you're saying and at first I was offended by that I thought it was rude and then I realized she was only telling me that because she wanted to understand what I was saying yeah. um, your accent is very soft it's very pronounced it's well, you know I uh, am not probably like the thickest of the thick like um, actually, my friend Dom, who I was talking about, who I lived with in England, he is part American, part Polish. But the first time he visited Northern Ireland, he said to me, your accent's quite like quite posh, isn't it? I'm like, did you not realize I was posh? Like, did you think I was common? But then, you know, I think the he just realized accent. that there were a lot thicker accents than mine when he came over here. You know? And the banker accent sort of sounds a little bit posher than the Belfast accent, generally speaking. Well, I, I grew up in Belfast and I went to school. In Belfast, but you know, yes, in North Down, it's slightly like this, isn't it? It's slightly anglified, and you'll notice that there's no twang in this accent. Whereas if it's real Belfast, there's a twang in that. Now, the importance of that is a twang makes your voice carry. As I talked about earlier, twang adds projection. American accents, people say, why did people go into an American accent when they sing pop? It's because an American accent has nasal twang, and nasal twang aids protect projection. I'm out of love. Let me be that has twang in it. If you've tried singing that, I'm out of love, you know, ugh, goes in the wrong style. So, Fair Hill's a big shopping center in Ballymena High. That's plenty of twang in it. So, when I'm working with people from certain parts of Northern Ireland, they've naturally got that projection because it's in the way that they speak. And then from other parts of Northern Ireland, not so much. It was the same when I lived in England. You know, the West Country accent, the kind of Oi be or firmer Oi be, it's got a bit of nasal twang to it. Well, it's the very RP. English accent. No, not yeah. so. you know. Let's, let's go back and talk about Elizabeth Holmes because I think she's fascinating. This is a fascinating story which... They'll make a movie um, out of it, I'm pretty sure, at some point. Do, do you want to tell the audience who this woman was and what it was she did? I do. Because yeah. this is absolutely fascinating. I, I'll be showing, uh, I'll have a link in the description up here linking to a video explaining much better than I can about Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes set up a company called Tharanus. Um, which claimed to be able to test your blood for certain medical health conditions. So that was the idea of Tharanus. The technology was completely fraudulent. It did not exist. But this company was a Fortune 500 company, probably top 50 companies in the world for about four or five years. Anyway, she set up this company at the age of 23, 24. Very, very pretty girl. And she basically did the same thing as Margaret Thatcher did. She brought her vocal tones all the way down to a very, very baritone thing whenever she spoke in public. And like, she was like Barry White. She had it way, 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 way down. But you could tell it was uncanny valley how low she spoke. Um, she also kind of imitated Steve Jobs and she wore the kind of the turtleneck and stuff. And how she was not spotted as being a fraudster years before, beyond understanding. But the whole idea that women need to lower their voice to be more authoritative, I disagree with. I think that when it comes to women in dating, if a woman shows up and she's got a very broad voice, that's, that's somewhat masculine. That would be a turnoff for me if, and, and a lot of men. What about Kate if, Blanchett? She has a very low voice. Do you not like the kind of Kate Blanchett alto Galadriel thing going there? Yeah, well, that's, that's not false. You know, it's that very it's kind of, you know, she was very bad. So she was very kind of, she spoke like a man and she was able to successfully fool people for about four or five years and become a multi-millionaire before going to prison. So she has an interesting story and a lot of her story is in her voice and her fake voice. 
I think it kind of reminds me a bit, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien, one of my favorite writers, talked about the voice of Saruman. And if he spoke, he'd put a spell on you. That mm -hmm. um, actually certain voices, for some reason, come across as being authoritative and that you can believe what they say. And she clearly worked on that. She worked on her voice. She worked on her image. She worked on the whole package. She worked on the presentation. The only thing she didn't work on was the actual product. Like it was known years in advance that this product didn't even work. But this, this company, it, survived on its reputation for about three, four, five years and her persona. And a lot of that was her voice and a lot of that was her stage persona that she was imitating Steve Jobs in so many ways and the kind of sensationalism of Silicon Valley. I think that what I would say when it comes to men and women, for men there is a something good about in deepening your voice, but mostly it's in how you pronounce and kind of um and pronouncing your syllables correctly. And this is something that you can work on. This is not something that is beyond your kind of 